Ford. All righty. I think I have my ducks in a row. Hey, you're on Lunch Conversations with Randy and Teddy. Those who don't know, I'm I'm Teddy, and the uh, the guy with the shiny top on his head is Randy. And our special guest today is uh, Trisha McManus, not Brent Campbell. Um, and Trisha is the superintendent of schools of Winston-Salem, Forsyth County Schools, and this is going to be a really cool conversation. But before we get started, I want to thank the Elder Law Firm in Greensboro, North Carolina, for being our sponsor. The Elder Law Firm cares about helping you to help those that you care about with their estate planning, elder care planning, and those seven documents that you need to make sure you take care of. So give the Elder Law Firm a call at 336-396-4551 or go to Elder Law Care, uh, excuse me, elderlawfirm.com online. And if you reach out to them, you must tell them that Randy sent you. Randy, you doing all right? I am. Teddy, why don't you tell them who you are, and then I'll, that'll buy me a minute or two to get this Your thing ducks in a row. all set yeah, up on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. Cool. So if everybody and everybody has ever met me, if you've never heard of me, then good golly, you've been hiding under a rock. Uh, I run a business called Burris Consulting. We teach LinkedIn as a business tool to business professionals, people on job search, sales leaders, et cetera, et cetera. Helping people use LinkedIn very purposefully. We do it one-on-one -on -one coaching, corporate training programs. Heck, I got a sandwich board where I stand out on the street and prophesize about it. That's the right word, really? Prophesize. I don't know how to spell it, much less pronounce it, but I'll go with that. That's yeah. good. So uh, introduce yourself, dude, <laughs> yeah. and then, then introduce um, uh, Trisha to our folks. Yeah, happy to. Uh, Randy Wooden with Goodwill Industries of Northwest North Carolina. I run our professional center based here in Winston-Salem, and as you might expect, we help professionals with a job hunt. You may be employed in looking or unemployed, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I've got clients across the country, but mostly here in the triad, we're happy to help put people back to work. That's what Goodwill does. And so uh, it's free, which is also kind of a cool thing, uh, but we do work by appointment. So I'll get you on the calendar, but you need to reach out to me on, on LinkedIn, and uh, we'll get that underway. A couple of times a week, I get together with a fellow there in the red shirt, and uh, on Monday, we have a little fun show, but on Wednesday, it's an hour long. Uh, I call it a lunch and learn, kind of, and we get to ask the questions and learn stuff. So today's no exception. Tricia McManus, superintendent with Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools, joins us, and we're going to cover a whole host of topics dealing with education. Uh, one thing we're not going to do, folks, and I always, Tricia, I always mention up front, here's kind of some of the stuff we want to cover um, we're not going to dive into politics. We're not going to, I mean, we just had an election, so everybody can take a deep breath. We're not going to go there, but we are going to learn about what motivates Tricia uh, in education, what brought her here to the triad. We're going to talk about some of the successes, some of the challenges that they face. Uh, also some surprises, good and bad, both um, coming into a new job. What are some things that you're kind of like, wow, that's really cool. Or yeah, I think I need to focus on that. We'll talk some of that stuff, um, maybe also some of the upcoming initiatives that, that they have, and uh, maybe reminisce a little bit. My mom was a school teacher. Uh, you've been in education for a long time. And, and uh, you know, how has education changed over the years and what things you've seen that have changed? And if you happen to be watching uh, as an attendee and you have comments or questions for Tricia, put them in the chat. My friend Teddy is going to keep an eye on that, an eagle eye. So, uh, and if it's something we can work in, we're gonna we're gonna do that. But first, Trisha, if you would, just to maybe a little more of your background, um, tell us more about who you are. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me uh, yeah. today on the show. And uh, so, yes, I've, I'm a career educator. I've been this is my 33rd year in uh, public education, and um, I spent 30 in the same school district and just kind of worked myself up wait, my way up in the system, uh, starting as a teacher. Um, not really starting the profession knowing where I was going to go, you know, what that career path would look like. But um, I knew I was excited about becoming a teacher. I am from a family of educators. I'm one of eight uh, children uh, born and raised in Tampa, Florida. Uh, father was a career teacher and head football coach. And, and so it was kind of in the blood out of eight kids. Uh, five of us became teachers. 
Um, so it was in the bud. And it, it's, you know, the more I stayed in the profession and, and moved from role to role, the more I really, my why became very clear. And I just think when people said, why'd you go into teaching? I said, what is more important than that? Or why do you go into this profession? What is more important than that? I feel like every day I have the opportunity to change, to change lives. Mm -hmm. And that's honestly what drives me every day and why I'm still in it 33 years later. And so, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I tell, tell people life is a journey and, and we, we learn as we go. And it uh, sounds like you've had the journey from the classroom to the other side, the administrative side yeah. and, and you're still jazzed about it. What brought you here anyway? You mentioned Tampa. So, yeah. uh, I mean, the weather's pretty nice there. <laughs> well, except for this <laughs> coming design. few days, these yeah, few yeah. days coming, they're going to get hit. But um, yeah. what brought you here to the triad? So I was, you yeah. know, I had I reached year 30 in Tampa and um, really I I had no plans to leave. Um, but I was part of an academy um, where it was a superintendent academy um, called the Broad Academy. And I met uh, another colleague in that academy that I didn't realize would, would become the superintendent here in, in Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools. And when she did, she actually called me and said, you know, would you be interested? The work, the, the position she was hiring for was a um, deputy superintendent position, but that position would be over the work of principals and over the work of school turnaround, which is my passion. Like that's the work I was doing in Hillsborough in my last uh, probably 10 years was, was related to developing the future leaders through a principal pipeline. Mm -hmm. And then also my last few years was really focused on turnaround. So I came here because honestly, the work, the work about what I love um, drew me here. But then on top of that, what convinced me, because I, I really, mm -hmm. after all those years, wasn't going to move, was was really the community as a whole. Uh, Winston-Salem for Scythe County is a, a beautifully diverse community. Um, there is such great philanthropic support and business support and involvement and investment of the community. Um, and it's, it's a really perfect size. I mean, it's just, there's so much. And honestly, something I have loved, loved, loved when we talk yeah. about Tampa and beautiful weather, I have loved the seasons of North Carolina. I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> and I've never <laughs> been with seasons. So this was a big deal. Um, but that's what drew me here. It's just continuing to do yeah. the work that I know can make a huge difference. Yeah, you get a little snow from time to time. If, uh, if it's not ice, a little snow. Did you get us? Have you bought a snow shovel yet? Um, I have. <laughs> I have one. Yes, I actually have one. There you go. Yeah. I used to use a broom for a while, and then we got enough snow here. I, I'm from Rhode Island and lived in Ohio for a long time, oh, so wow. I'm coming down from the other side of the country down here. So I'm loving it because spring is longer, summer, you know, and winter's kind of you know, like that. I, I, I like that. Um, so it, one of eight kids. Wow. So I bet you know, came supper time. You know, you were, had to <laughs> had to be right on top of things. And uh, yeah. hey, good good stuff. So let's let's pivot a little bit. We'll talk about some of the successes. Mm -hmm that you've seen um, with this, the school system. And I don't know if you want to break it down to individual schools or like high school versus middle school versus elementary. I mean, you can take this any way you want to, but what are some things that, you know, you say, Hey, this, this, this has really worked well so far. We're really on, on where we want to be. Um, yeah. So, I mean, at the end of this mm -hmm. last school year, which was, you know, right. At, we were, we dealt with the pandemic as everyone knows. Yep. And then, you know, last year was a continuation with COVID and absences and all of that based on regulations. Um, I would say that with that in mind, we still, we had 75% of our schools meet or exceed growth last school year. And so that's a big, that was a big plus. Um, the district, the state as a whole took a hit when it came to, um, to achievement data. And so did we. Luckily, we grew a lot from that the, the year that there was kind of a, a balance between remote and not and not remote. Last year, we made some great gains based on that year. And so we're moving back in the upper direction. And there are some individual schools that just knocked it out of the park. I mean, I'll just, you know, some of our schools um, that exceeded growth were some of our schools that have been, um, have, have struggled with performance over time. And so they literally exceeded growth this school year. Um, Ibrahim and Petrie, and um, uh, Old Town, and I mean, I could go on. We have uh, Reagan High School continues to exceed growth year after year. I mean, I don't even like to call out individual schools because we have so many great things happening within our schools. Um, and so we're moving in the right track with our data. Um, it's not fast enough for me. Um, 
I, I, and I'm very competitive, ultra competitive. So not within my own team, but against other teams for sure. Um, it's probably being raised by a football coach, but, um, <laughs> but I will say that yeah. you know, we've got a long way to go, but our data is, is getting better. So some other things I'm excited about, um, we've got a major focus on a 90 by 25 initiative. So if you think about our two big rocks right now, it is really on literacy. And that is making sure that all of our third graders can read on grade level. And that is a huge benchmark that we're working towards. And we, we have synergy around this and not just within our school district, but across the community. I mean, it's one of, yeah, go ahead. Randy. How, how do you, you know, I hear that. Well, are they reading on grade level? How, who, who, and how is it determined what grade level is? I, right. I, I've right. always wondered that. Yeah. You know, that is a really good question. How do you know? Because there are different assessments, but the one that, we are held accountable to mm -hmm. the most from the public's view of our data is the end of end of grade exam that is a state administered exam. So basically it's it's a state created assessment that's on the standards, the state standards. And it is a, a, again a very rigorous assessment. So we have other assessments that work our way up to that. Like we use um, uh, uh, Dibbles, which is another, it's a, another way to assess reading. We, we use iReady, which is another way to assess reading. But at the end of the day, what people see in the newspaper or the public mm -hmm. view that is part of grading schools is what's called the EOG, end of course, end of grade exam. I remember um, that term when my kids were in school. So they yeah. still have those. And again, I, I may be a dinosaur here because my kids graduated, what, 15 years ago. So uh, I'm not sure what may have changed, but I, 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 I want to learn. So, uh, I, yeah. what are some other things you've got in the in the works here that yeah. that are so, uh, some recent successes? Yeah. So we've got a lot of great things happening with literacy. Just to finish that mm -hmm. that yeah. big rock, um, we've all of our K to five. We've, we've we've all of our schools have classroom libraries that are brand new, like so that kids can have books in their hands. We've got reading warriors up and running, where volunteers come into schools and work with individual students. We have probably close to to two hundred adults that are coming in and that was just started last school year we've got a group of community members that comes together regularly called the ed initiative that just works on how can we break down any barriers that might be preventing kids from being able to read on grade level by third grade and and those are things related to health care we've got health health workers in our in this group we've got business community uh, we've got um, the faith our faith-based community in this group but it's a cross-functional team that is really invested in 90 by 25. And so we, we've got a lot of energy moving in the direction of 90 by 25, um, that, that third grade reading goal, 90% of third graders reading on grade level by 2025. The other big area that I'm really excited about, um, and I saw evidence yesterday of this mm -hmm. starting to take root. And that is I met with 59 high school students yesterday as part of my superintendent advisory. And the students talked at the beginning about what was going well in their schools. And I didn't want it to be, I, I was hoping what I would hear is what I heard. And they okay. said things like, there are more clubs that have been added. There's more opportunity for student voice. Um, we're working on connecting with each other. Like things that to me, honestly, if you don't have that, the academics are not gonna happen either. If you don't have a culture where kids feel included, where they feel like they're they're cared for, where they feel connected. That is really important for our, our students. And so hearing yesterday from the voice of students that they're feeling that change is important. So our, our other big rock is really around our school culture and climate. And we've done a lot there. Um, I used funding that we got from federal dollars to hire 30 mm -hmm. more social workers so we could have more people that are licensed to support kids in schools um, with, with help that they might need around mental health. Um, we have um, a new code of character conduct and support, which is really honestly about setting very clear expectations in schools for, for, for students and, and make sure that it's clear so that they can rise to those expectations, but also work towards um, finding preventative measures like mentoring and things that can actually get kids connected before they start to go down a path of, of potentially getting in trouble. And so our new code is it's not free of consequences, but it's really rooted in um, restorative practices and it's, it's culture and just honestly making sure kids feel connected to school. And based on some of their comments yesterday, we're starting to move in that direction. Again, mm -hmm. I, want, I want to go back to when you talk about yeah. how a school changed. I want to go back to why all of us loved 
going to school. Hopefully a lot of us did. I know we, sure. we went because it was expected. Yeah, but I also, I also loved it because of, not because of my classes, I'm just going to tell you, but I loved the other parts of it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's what I'm trying to bring back for our kids where they all have something they love about school. So there's a, there's a book called Atomic Habits. Yep. Uh, James Clear, I think is the dude's name. And just as you said, Trisha, you didn't go to school because you love to learn per se. You went to school because of the other things around it that they're involved in. And so if you know, Atomic Habits talks about stacking things up that, so I don't want to do this, uh, Teddy, I don't want to go walking two miles every morning. But I love listening to my podcast. And the only time I listen to my podcast is during my two mile, my, my two mile walk. And the same thing with school. If you can find that, as you're talking about, lots, I'm writing down all this stuff. This is like, I, I did not know this. You know, reading warriors and breaking down barriers and, and the students will have more clubs and more opportunities to s discover they're cared for. If you create that environment, they'll learn along the way. Yep, yeah, exactly. That's, that's cool stuff. I wonder, I was going to ask you about the, the, the code of character, and you, you touched on that. So, I mean, back in the day, you know, you hear about the, you know, in the Catholic school with the, the ruler on the on the wrist and the hand. Teddy, did you get a ruler cracked over your, you've got a oh, ruler. Man, you should see the bruises, dude. They're still there. But, 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 you know, there was, there was, I mean, more physical discipline uh, handed out back in the day. And of course, that kind of corporal punishment went away. But then, you know, you know, you had the, what in school suspension. I no, Teddy, I never experienced that, but uh, I can tell I'm you sure all you about did. It, Randy. Tell me all about it. Um, <laughs> so, what what is really changing here? What, can you put some meat on the bones with this thing? Help help a layman understand. So, are they going into suspension, or what's really changing to help change so, the culture of this thing? Right. So, so I I think it's funny that you're talking about the ruler because I was told in elementary school that if I turned around again, that. Uh, the teacher was going to pop my head off like a chicken. That would not fly today. <laughs> um, that would definitely yeah. not fly today. But right. so our our change of of our our changes around this. <clears throat> we have um, for the last you know ten years or even even more. And I I can't really talk much in, before that as yeah. I look at data. We have had a lot of students where the the answer to everything was suspension. And so um, there are reasons and a, a time for a suspension, and it could be related to violent behavior, but the violent behavior is not going to change just by exclusion, just by go home, come back, it happens again. You, you, we've got to continue to teach behavior, just like we teach reading and writing and math, we have to incorporate that. And so um, here, so, so every school that I've gone to in my 30 years where that was out of control, that was you yeah. know, a lot of behavior problems, a lot of issues. First and foremost, um, there was a lack of clarity around expectations. And so when you walked in the door, it should be very known to students, to everyone, parents, staff. Here is, I'll just go Wiley Middle School. When I walk into Wiley a few weeks ago, it says, here's the Wiley way. Here's what we expect there. And every school needs to be clear about that. And a lot of times when you go mm -hmm. into chaos, it's because there's there's no clear expectation. And my favorite quote is nobody rises to low expectations. So set the bar high and then lift your kids to meeting that bar. And that's first and foremost, how you start to shift a culture is to be very clear. And it's not a one-time reminder at the beginning of the year. It's every single day. Yeah. It's in every single classroom. It's common throughout an entire building. I've seen schools. I was actually principal of a school that was, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, behavior was, out of control. And I, the school was open. And when I got there, I was like, oh my gosh. And I worked with a behavior specialist and we got the school on track. And in no time, it was going from fights all the time, kids running out of classroom without permission. Um, kid, it was, it was like a kid run, you know, and, and I want kids to kind of own and, and run school, but not in the wrong direction. I want them to be, yeah, you know, yeah. involved, but not in <laughs> like, it's like a, a, a takeover um, of the adults, but but what I will say is we changed the culture completely. And so back to some specifics, it's about looking for how do we prevent, there are very specific strategies outside of clear expectations for preventing misbehavior. It's, it's clarity, it's, it's very specific um, routines in classroom. It's learning how to deescalate a behavior instead of making it worse by your response. And so if I have a child who does something in my class, 
if I say you're not going to do that in my classroom versus you try to use a, a more de-escalate that like language that will de-escalate. That's what we're teaching our folks to do. Also, mm -hmm. there is a lot of research now around childhood trauma mm -hmm. and around how that trauma plays out in behaviors. And so our adults are being trained on trauma informed practices. We are part of a community, a community training um, by the uh, uh, Center for Trauma Informed Communities. It's mm -hmm. right here local in Winston Salem, and and we're working with them to to train teachers and leaders, and and so it's a it's a effort. It's not one thing. It's not one strategy. It's a lot of different strategies. And also on the preventative side, is if you have children that are absent a lot, or you have children that are <laughs> getting in are fighting a lot, or you know pairing them with mentors, pairing them with adult mentors that can visit them, that can be part of that. So again. There are lots of different strategies. We also have, and I know there's been some negative buzz around the country about social emotional learning, but at the at the end of the day, having a curriculum that mm -hmm. teaches kids about empathy and about um, about uh, respect and about all of that is really important. I remember that being part of my learning growing up. And so that's, that's what we're doing too, where we're not just leaving it to chance, but we are actually explicit. And that's also getting positive traction within our buildings. So all of that is part of creating a positive culture. And I can tell you, there, there is so much evidence. I've lived it. So mm -hmm. I have personal research, but there's also so much evidence around how people feel in an environment and how they excel in that environment are directly related. And yeah. so that's what this is about. Yeah. So we, we teach yep. in business, Trish, and you know this in business, we teach business leaders emotional intelligence. We teach social engagement yep. at the at the business level, and probably I, 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 as you're saying this, I'm like, wow, why why were we not teaching this at kindergarten? Uh, I get it. I, I've heard the stories of the of those who are challenged with why we are teaching children stuff that we've never taught them before. And I've heard the challenges of teachers who say, hey, I'm supposed to be teaching math and English. And no, you're supposed to be teaching young adults to be successful, including math and English. Yeah. So, yeah. Our guest today is Tricia McManus, superintendent in Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools. Tricia, I want to follow up because you just mentioned about how you lived it. You, you, you were brought up with what I'll call how to behave. For lack of a, a better word. Now, so, Rand, Rand, I'm yeah. not going to forget the one quote. And I'm figuring out where to use that one quote that she was told that if she doesn't turn around and sit straight, her she gonna get her head snapped off like a chicken. Like I'm, a, I'm, like I'm thinking chicken. about how to use that. <laughs> I'm not I guess I. I guess I have to wonder. I mean, these kids show up at school and you don't know what the heck's been going on when they leave the school. So they yeah. show up. So help me understand uh, from, a, I guess, a holistic standpoint. Are you engaging also with the parents and helping them become yeah. better at parenting, for lack of, again, a better word? How, how's that looking? So the parents. So I'll, yeah. I'll tell you um, this. And, and a lot when I say I've lived it, I and I'm not talking about even in my childhood, I'm talking about as a school principal. Yeah that went into a school that was yeah. considered failing. Um, it was an F in Florida. And we, I worked with the staff, with the parents, with the community to, to really just change the entire culture of that school and bring that, that school grade up over two years. I, I'll tell you that, um, so knowing the stories of your children and getting to know their families is really important. And when people say things like, the families don't care, the parents don't care, that, that that is not true. And it really is about approach, how we approach them. I have countless families in where I was a principal that was a, what, what people would say, a very underserved community in Tampa, right on the outskirts of downtown. And people might've said, oh, the parents aren't involved. The parents don't. When I got there, it might've felt that way. But in the four years I was there, that was no longer the feeling because of I just walk across the street and knock on doors. I would, you know, we would bring parents to the table. I had a student services team of a psychologist and a social worker and a counselor and a behavior specialist and myself that we would triage every situation and we would make sure that the families were brought to the table. Yeah. They have to be part of the solution. And so when families feel part of the solution and feel respected um, to help be part of the decision-making for their child, you, you really turn the corner and I didn't allow anyone that worked in my school. We we and I am a 
and not a command and control leader. I am. I believe you lead through influence by inspiring and, tr and building trust within your, your folks and inspiring them. Um, but I, there were some things that I were non-negotiables to me. And so talking about using words like these parents or these kids or and generalizations was not allowed on my campus because we had to, to number one, respect everyone that walked in our door, mm -hmm. um, respect the families of our children and make sure we brought them to the table as part of the we. And so that that's really, really important. But um, but yeah, every kid has a story. Mm -hmm. Every adult has a story. Mm -hmm. And if we, we treat everybody the same every day and say, yeah. I'm sorry, there's no exception like if you walk in in a bad place today, I'm sorry, you just can't do that. That's just not real life. And so the same, you know, we expect to be treated a certain way as adults. Well, our children deserve to be treated and, and we need to know their stories. And that was what's really important in a school is that, you know, every one of your kids and their stories, they are not, we are not producing widgets in education. Yeah. We've got little bodies in our schools and big yeah. bodies in our schools. And knowing them and protecting them and caring for them and loving them and pushing them to excellence is our job as educators. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'll compare this with the, the work that I do at Goodwill and the work others at Goodwill do. You know, if somebody has the want to, we can teach them the how to. Yes. They have the want to and the motivation to improve, whether it's to get a better job, to learn new skills, to improve their lot in life. Uh, if they have the want to, we can teach the how to, but like some wise philosopher once said, you can't push a wet noodle. I don't know who that was, but that's, I'll, that'll be, Teddy, that'll be my quote for this show. You can't push a wet noodle. Uh, in I mean, other words, you can't- research on that, Randy. I don't know. Yeah, you can't, <laughs> you can't force somebody into something if they're not willing and ready to but, accept. But and, what, what yeah, I heard yeah. Trisha say is yeah. that you can encourage and you can mm -hmm. make sure that they know who they are, whoever they are, student, parent, community, yep. et cetera, that there's a chair at this table that we, we would love to have you be a part of. And the moment they realize that you really want them to be at the table and, and be a part of the solution, then it changes. Am I saying that right, Tricia? Absolutely. I, yeah. I know that the noodle, the the new, I like my thought sometimes is you gotta, you gotta kind of bring that person along. Like, so they may not think that they have the will right now. They might not be demonstrating they don't have the will, but there are a lot of people that have demonstrated they didn't have the will and that I, over time with a lot of, uh, positive reinforcement, little coercion <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that decided you know what, maybe I do have more will than I thought I was going to have. And so yep. like, yeah. for me, it's, it's just not giving up on people and just keep pushing. But you're right. I mean, if someone has the will, it is so much easier to, to bring them along. Um, sometimes kids, when it comes to behaviors, you know, sometimes, you know, if, it, if, if, if exclusionary practices start at a young age yeah. and you're a little kid and you're being, you know, kind of pushed out because of choices you're making, you start to create in your brain that that's, you don't belong. You don't, you know, I'm just, this is not going to be for me. And so if that happens enough time, there's also direct correlation between um, exclusionary practices starting, you know, early and not graduating mm -hmm. from high school. It, there's a vicious cycle that we create and we've got to like change that cycle and, and know that the behaviors, sometimes there's a reason for them. And we, instead of like going to this punitive, all the time punitive, mm -hmm because I said so mentality, which is really a command and control that we got to change that. And, and being an inspire and trust, and I, I, Covey is, I mean, Covey is, there's so many leadership gurus out there, but Covey's work I love. And so my favorite book right now is Trust and Inspire. So you'll hear uh, me talk about that in relationship to, or in opposition to command and control. And command and control does, it does not, does not really work in business uh, no. with the adults, nor with the children. So. Yeah. And if, if the only attention that you get is negative when you act out uh, and kids want to get attention, uh, they want to get it. But if it could be positive reinforcement versus punitive negative yeah. and t helping to kind of adjust that dynamic. Teddy, we're getting close to halftime. Yes. If you want to. I want to do that in a minute yeah. after I okay. tell, after I uh, spare Trisha with my previous thought about a quote. And I have a new one from you okay. that I'm going to use, Trisha, and that is exclusionary practices can impact a person for a lifetime. Yeah, I'm exactly. with you. Thank so, you. Cool. Hey, let me, um, 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 bottom of the hour, you're on Lunch Conversations with Randy and Teddy. 
Our special guest today is Trisha McManus, Superintendent of Schools of Winston-Salem, Forsyth County Schools. Um, and she's schooling Randy and I on some really cool stuff, and, uh, and our audience today is absorbing it. So uh, our, our uh, sponsors for the show is the Elder Law Firm out of Greensboro, North Carolina, who's important to you and how you plan to serve them uh, is also important to the Elder Law Firm out of Greensboro, North Carolina. So if you have not helped them put together those seven documents, and I keep referring to that because I learned about that myself, reach out to the Elder Law Firm in Greensboro, 336-396-4551. Let them know that you heard about this during the conversation with Tricia McManus. Back to you, buddy. Yeah, and I'm you know, I'm ready to pivot, but before I pivot to the some of the challenges you face, is there anything else you'd like to add from whether we're talking about conduct or other other topics that we've already covered? Anything else you want to throw um, in there? You know what? Just something coming yeah. up, and then I'll I'll wrap up on uh, initiatives. We've we've got a lot of, of mm -hmm. great things happening, all aligned to a, a strategic plan that I that I love and I believe in. Mm -hmm. um, but we are about to embark on a major attendance campaign and. What we've realized is last year we had about 40% of students that were chronically absent. That's a big deal. How many um, percent? What did you say? About 40, about 40%. About 40%. Percent. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Some of that has to do with um with COVID. I mean, COVID last year, you I think at the beginning of the year before things changed um with our health department, I think you had to be out 10 days. Mm -hmm. So that that I could see yeah. why it was probably more. But back to that, attendance is a concern in, in general. Even prior to the pandemic, we might not have been at 40%, but it is a concern. And so the other big thing is wanting our, our meeting our kids and wanting them to be in school every day. If we've got all these tutors coming in, but you're missing half the time, you're going to be missing for that 90 by 25 goal. You're going to be missing some of that support and intervention mm -hmm. um, and some high quality instruction. So we're about to embark on a major attendance campaign that we're going to want in our entire community uh, to help us with. And that's from all of our parents to our businesses. We want to post be attendance posters and, and everywhere health hospitals doctors offices everywhere we need our kids in school yeah. so that yeah. kind of puts the bow on all of that and that we yeah. is a big we it's not just trish and her people it's our society yep you know uh, we mentioned before the show i got to to in, engage with you briefly during the uh, leadership winston uh, presentation that you gave to the the best class ever of 2022 uh, but we were also in one of the high schools or in several of the high schools. And if memory serves me and correct me here, but the school had a specific position created for, I think we'll call it graduation coach. Was it something yeah. like, yeah. Yes. To help, yeah. Help me understand what that, what that, because I, I hadn't heard of that position before. I mean, we have, you know, career guidance counselors and that kind of a thing, but this was a different bit of a different thing to help kids to ensure that they graduate. Uh, help yeah. us understand what that is. Yeah, so so your graduation rates are determined by graduating with your cohort. So when ninth graders start together, they graduate right. at the same time at the end of that 12th grade school year. Yeah. Yeah. And so there are some kids um, and, and more that got off track uh, during the pandemic where their credits mm -hmm. are low, where they're missing a lot and, and they've got a lot to make up. And so we we instituted through our federal ESSER dollars, which have been very helpful to us. We have those dollars till 2024. We instituted a graduation coach position. And these positions mm -hmm. are work directly with students, a targeted group of students that may be off track toward graduating with their cohort. So they, they work with them, they meet with them, they, mm -hmm. they talk with their counselors, making sure that they're getting the right classes to be able to get on track, making sure that they're successful in their classes. Um, so that they can graduate on time with their cohort and then be ready for post-secondary. So, yep. Yep. Good role. So I see, Teddy, I was paying attention that day. I wasn't just, uh, you know, chowing down in the cafeteria. <laughs> Randy, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you Throwing a star. spitballs. Remember they had you know, a for that day, buddy. Yeah, I didn't get my wrist slapped. That was, that, that was when things were fun. You could throw spitballs and not get in major trouble. I mean, it <laughs> back, in the, back in the day, back in the day, the worst thing was you go <laughs> take it out back after school, you know, and. And, now, you know, now, nowadays is like, holy cow, I don't know. Mm, 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 and know, now mm. I'm understanding a little bit more about Trisha and her relationship with her teachers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, some challenges. You're talking about test scores post-COVID. So, I mean, COVID changed everything, how we 
uh, everything, how we live our lives, how we go to work, how we go to school, everything it changed everything. So that's a big old topic uh, and also challenges regarding uh, school safety. So I'd like to dive into some of that. You know, it seems like every other week or month, there's a shooting somewhere, there's this violence, whatever. And so that now becomes part of the mosaic of, of yeah. education and you got to deal with it. You can't just not deal with it. So let, let's dive into some of that stuff. So test scores, you talked to yeah. some of the, about that. What else can you can you talk about? Maybe lessons learned from COVID or or other things that are what I'll call COVID related that may help going forward. As hopefully it won't happen yeah. again. But yeah, if something like that comes up again, you're better prepared for it. Yeah. 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 Oh, I can tell you right now, I want to be in school no matter what. <laughs> yeah. And and the reason being is, you know, our kids. What what, what we've realized a lot and what you know kids and and learning is a social process and there Mm -hmm. are some learners that that can thrive in a in a space where they're trying to by themselves and they've got they're in the computer and they're reading there are some learners but uh the majority of our learners need that social interaction need that hands-on instruction from the teacher which is very Mm -hmm. hard to get from a computer screen and so or, or even if the teacher's on the computer but uh, um, so, so test scores, you know, we, we had even prior to the pandemic, we had major achievement gaps. Um, when you look at our, our test scores, um, and, and basically, basically, and those were between our racial subgroups, but also, um, our students with exceptionalities. Um, we have a lot of our schools. I was looking at our data the other day that actually mm-hmm. exceeded or met growth with our students with exceptionalities, which made me very happy this school year. But still, if you look historically, there's there's just been gaps, and they're they really are basically created by opportunity gaps. And so we're trying to address those achievement gaps by closing the opportunity gaps and making sure that all students have access to rigorous coursework, that there are not barriers keeping them from that rigorous coursework. And so the test scores is going to be something that we continue. Our, our, our test data has to be something we continue to focus on. And it is. And we're doing that in many ways. I already mentioned that whole, the whole 90 by 25 initiative. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is no um, replacement for a high quality, highly effective teacher in a classroom. And there's no substitute for that engaging hands-on instruction. And so our focus right now is, is making sure that learning is engaging, exciting, fun for students. Mm-hmm. Going back to why teachers went into the profession in the first place. They love, they love their craft of teaching. Um, yep. Yep. They, they love their students. And so I expect, I want to see noise in classrooms. I want to see hands-on. I want to see high engaging interaction with questioning and answer. And, and so it's just about getting back to that and making sure that every student gets high quality instruction every day. And that is is huge. And then also making sure that we've got students that have opportunities for that those that might fall behind a little bit that they've got tutoring and interventions right there on campus that are just in time. And so that's another focus. We've, we put a lot of dollars into on-site tutorials and tutoring after school programs and things that can help kids that might need additional support. So the test scores, absolutely, yes. Yeah, Teddy. Teddy cat bit his tongue. So uh, to find that phrase for me, Tricia, um, students with exceptionality. I think I understand it, but that I, 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 you're the first person I've heard use that phrase. Yeah. Well, and most people probably say students with disabilities. Okay. So okay. it's it's our okay. EC students. I'm, I'm a mom of a of a daughter with Down syndrome, yeah. and so I always just use exceptionalities just because it sounds better. Like I, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's. I do know what you mean. Students with disabilities is <laughs> yeah. what most people. The term most people would use there. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, let's let's pivot for, for a moment. Let's talk the safety issue. Uh, that I mean, we all want to yeah. feel safe in our homes, in our work, in our schools, in our environment, and you know it doesn't happen by accident. So, uh, what are what are some things that you can share? Um, I'm sure you can't share all the details because that then you'd have to then you'd have to kill us, right? But uh, <laughs> or snap your head off like a chicken. Snap it off like a chicken. <laughs> But uh, what are some things that, yeah, what are some things that the the school system has looked at or has implemented to help us understand, put our uh, our minds at ease a bit, uh, hopefully that, uh, you know, you've got your eye on the ball with this thing and and you're making progress. Absolutely. I think that school safety, like, so that is honestly number one. Number two then goes into all the learning because you can't learn where you don't feel safe. And so I, I will say that um, in our, I'm very proud of our team. I've got an incredible mm-hmm. uh, chief of safety, security, and emergency management. He was a team of one 
we he has now has an actual has a team. And so okay. we've got okay. we've got five folks under him that all have a set of schools that they're responsible for. Um, when I got here, I take no credit for this. We've actually added recently, but our district has done a really phenomenal job with um, some of the hardening of our schools, meaning like the cameras. I mean, there's there's cameras everywhere in our schools and that, that has, was here. I mean, since I've been here, maybe we've upgraded some of them with grant funding, but the mm -hmm. cameras have been there. We've had, um, we've had very clear crisis management plans for every school. And as a district, we've just continued to improve those. We've had those common protocols and terms since I came here, but we've just improved those. We are now part of uh, I Love You Guys and our entire district with law enforcement partners. And that is PD and Sheriff's Office. We have great partnerships with those entities and Kernersville Police. We all came to the table to do I Love You Guys training. And so now we all have the same language for all protocols, whether it be a secure, a lockdown, a shelter in place, whatever they mean, we are all on the same page and working together. Um, we've got SROs in our middle middle schools and high schools um, that are, you know, they, we again, we have a really strong partnership with the Sheriff's Office where our SROs, um, uh, where they place our, the SROs in our schools. We've got um, uh, access, like one-way en entry points, mm -hmm. which we've just, like honestly tightened up on in all of our schools because we just put where kids have to go in between buildings, you gotta have a way to get in, a pass, a student number to be able to get into those buildings because there were so mm -hmm. many entry points in to some of our high schools. And so we've literally, we've tightened up all mm -hmm. of that. And, and we just got another grant, $700,000 to go back to our elementary schools because we've got a lot of modulars on our campuses yeah. and so, yeah getting from the modulars back into the buildings can be an issue. And so we're now putting more of those keypads at elementary as well. So as far as like the hardening of our schools um, with, with cameras and with entry, like access control, we are on it with all of that. Um, you know, we were asked a lot, we've been asked a lot about what do you think about metal detectors? We hired, I mean, we last year purchased um, portable metal detectors to be able to be used when needed. Large sporting events, if there is a threat made to a school, you can uh, you can pull out those metal detectors that day. They they roll, they're they're movable. And, uh, you know, they can they can move around and so rather than put ones that are there all the time, we chose that path and you can use it when necessary. We use um, anonymous reporting apps that kids report all the time on that hey, heard this, saw this on social media. That's really important. We are able to get most things, I mean, honestly, we find out law enforcement with our security team goes in. If a kid, if there's if someone's gonna have a weapon on campus, they they know it as kids are entering and can and can and can look into that. Um, so I feel like the hardening mm -hmm. is is good. I think the other part of this, when I think about school safety, is all the parts I talked about about culture yeah. and about yep. getting at that side to prevent some of the the violence. I mean, that you know, when we think about a lot of active shooters, when we think, and I don't know every case of them, but I've, we've lived through a lot of active shooters in schools. Most of those people have had signs along the way. How have we addressed all that? I think that's why we're so much focused on the culture and the counseling and all of that. Um, and I'm not saying that stuff would have been prevented, but I'm saying is mm -hmm. if we can connect kids and make sure that you know, we are, we, bullying is not happening, that everyone feels included and connected. That's part of it. But the, honestly, the, the security part of it is to me very important as well. And that's where we have focused all these grant dollars. So it, it was interesting. I was a little, uh, um, you know, felt bad and maybe horrified or whatever the right word is. We're uh, great. They interviewed some Greensboro, um, um, I, I, what's the term, the police officers in Greensboro, CROs, SROs, SROs. SROs. Uh -huh. they interviewed uh, Guilford County SROs and the, the, the stories that came from that were horrible where uh, they, the Greensboro SRO said 2022 has been the most violent year in Guilford County ever in the Guilford County school systems. Wow. Um, that was, that was hard to hear, but you know, we, and I like your approach, Trisha, you, you got to harden, you got to do all that stuff, but you got to create an environment. And if you're not creating, the, and I'm yep. not saying that's Guilford's problem, but if you're not creating the right environment, you create an opportunity for bad actors. 
Hey, let's let's pivot to uh, something that encouraging and, and promising that uh, I think we can all get behind. That is uh, pleasant surprises. Uh, you moved here from Tampa, and you get to kind of look at the landscape, and then <clears throat> and you uh, you know move into the the superintendent's role. And so, anything that you looking back, you it was maybe a pleasant surprise, something you hadn't thought about, and you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. Um. I would say honestly, yeah. community community support investment yeah. in the educational system. Um, there is a huge investment, and and I'm not talking even money wise. I'm talking about just people very interested in our school system. Yeah. And I guess some people might say that can also be unpleasant at times. But no, <laughs> for me, it's been very pleasant. It's been a pleasant experience um, because I, I I'm constantly like everywhere I go people are, are interested. And I think that's, I think that's a good thing. Like, I'm, I, and I, it, it's, again, pe- we have, we have thousands of volunteers in our school system, like signed yeah. up and people that want to show up for our kids. Uh, we've got groups, countless groups that are part of after school programs. We have, we have advocacy groups that have partnered with the school district. Like, like I have never seen such an incredible amount of community support. It's very exciting. I think the biggest issue with it, 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 and I think we're all getting there, is like, how do we streamline those efforts and do some things really well versus duplication of efforts? And I I don't know, I just think we have an incredible community. Um, Our healthcare community, everything, our philanthropic community, our our faith-based community, our government agencies, everybody's Supportive and all in. Yeah. Well, well, Mayor, was, Mayor yeah. Alan Joins was yeah. on the show a couple of weeks ago, Trisha, and he applauded your efforts. And he, he he alluded to the fact that we have a community that loves to help our school systems. Yeah. 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 I love our mayor as well. So flip that around. Anything that you kind of like you open the drawer and you go, Oh, I didn't know that was in there. Ooh, I gotta I gotta deal with that. Uh anything anything <laughs> oh, that yeah comes to mind that you, you maybe hadn't expected that not necessarily negative, but just maybe a little more challenging maybe than you thought it might've been coming in. Yeah, I would honestly, I would say that um, mm-hmm. coming to a new system, you know, you've got a whole new set of policies and mm-hmm. every single day I uncover a new one and just want to like, kind of, you know, take out my little lighter and light that piece of paper and on fire and put, and say, yeah. no, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. And I think it's really just, there are so many policies and honestly, a lot of them were created a long, 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 long time ago. Yeah. And they just haven't changed over time. So my team is <clears> tackling <throat> what are the things that are either outdated, maybe at that time they made sense, but now they don't. How do we need to change those? And so I think it's every day just uncovering, you know, I'm learning a lot every day. I've been in this job for a year and a half. And I am every day like unpeeling more or uncovering more and more about things that, okay, we've, we've got to kind of change that um, just because, you know, it's 30 years later and there a lot changes over time and we've got to kind of change with the times as well. Yeah. We'll talk uh, upcoming initiatives. You've already mentioned about the attendance campaign. So we've covered that, but I'm curious um, in, in um, some show prep that we did, uh, you want to talk a little bit about a, a, a pipeline teacher yeah. and principal pipeline. Help us understand what that is. Yeah. So we, we've mm-hmm. got two, two pipelines and actually I, I would say it's kind of one pipeline and then it, mer- yeah. it goes yeah. out into two. And so it's getting great talent. The whole premise behind our pipelines is getting great talent into our school district. And that is eventually we want the best principals, you know, as a teacher comes in, they're going to be on that path and they can stay as a teacher. They can become a teacher leader or they can go to the path of administration and become an assistant principal and principal one day. And so really having those those paths built out clearly with a set of competencies that we need demonstrated by the leaders and the teachers is part of the work we're doing right now. And it's really exciting. I mean, we've got on the teacher pipeline, we have so many partners at the table with us right now between Forsyth Tech and Winston-Salem State and Wake Forest University. And um, oh my God, the list goes on High Point and A&T and, and Salem College. Like all these folks are with us um, to, to help us beef up that teacher pipeline and, and future teacher candidates. But then we also are doing work around advanced teacher roles, which are teachers that become leaders on their campus 
still are educating kids every day, but are also supporting the coaching of their peers. So you've got these advanced teacher roles, which add more money to a person's pocket if they choose to go in that path. And so that's another part of that pipeline. Now, those that choose to go to the principal pipeline, we've been, we received a four point, I can't remember what, 4.6 million from the Wallace Foundation to create an equity-centered principal pipeline. So it's, we're trying to produce leaders um, that are ready to go into schools that are, you know, equity-minded leaders that can actually drive in improvement for all students in their buildings. And so we've just, we've created the entire infrastructure to make that happen. And these pipelines are critical to the future. If we don't have a good succession plan in place yeah. for yeah. future leaders in our district and teachers, when there is a, 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 a teacher shortage and yeah. not just teachers, yeah. there's an employee shortage in education. Um, if we don't address that very intentionally, we're going to be struggling in a few years. And so that is my goal is to just really have a, a bench of talent that we can turn to at all times. Yeah. Well, and, you know, you read in the news that two students aren't going into education as much as they used to. And, you know, something I looked at some years back, this is a long time ago, I looked at, I think it was called lateral entry. Yeah. Um, you know, here I have, you know, college degree, a business experience, that kind of a thing. Yes. Uh, is that something that you still tap into a good bit or help help us understand that? Where Do you, yeah, do you emphasize that never, program? It, yeah, it's never too late. It's honestly, Randy mm -hmm. and Teddy, if you all want to come back and be teachers, you can be lateral entry. It is never too late. And I will tell you, the lateral entry is still very important. Yeah. But what is what is really great about our pipeline for teachers is that um, we have now residency programs that we are that we received a grant to be able to fund where we could take someone that mm -hmm. is lateral entry, put them through this residency to get their license. So it's, it's so that they don't have to use the big, take the big cost of like a university preparation or things like that, even though we do have good university partners for this as well. But yep, we, we, we train you up. You don't have the internships. So you haven't been with kids necessarily in a classroom, but these no. residencies train you up and provide you with on-site coaching so you can be successful as a later, lateral entry. Because there's a lot, if you haven't been in the classroom through a prep, through a, an internship that you're going to learn on the job pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, that's still a thing and it's still really important. Be, well, be we're, careful what you yeah. ask for, Trisha. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> you want me in the classroom? I don't know. Oh my God. <laughs> you don't want me there. Snap your neck <laughs> off like a chicken and use a ruler. <laughs> I'm going to call your mom. I'm going to yeah. call your mom right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we've I got would, just a few I, minutes. Look, got a couple that, minutes left, uh, Trisha, if you would. Um, you know, you know, we're, I'm going to ask you to give us a couple three uh, takeaways. But before I do, I, I did want to ask you this just real quick. How is it? My mom was a school teacher. I grew up, you know, she was an English teacher. So there, there you go. And that's why I know my it's it's and there, there and there and all of that stuff. Anyway, how has education changed? You're a school teacher from back in the day. Looking back, yeah. how's it, how, how things changed? Good, bad, or ugly, anything. It's changed a lot. I, I think yeah. I think that um, accountability is really important, but I also think that some of the high stakes accountability that was created, um, you know, it's done some good and some bad. So in other words, yeah. you know, I thought, you know, back in the day of No Child Left Behind, where we started actually looking at specific um, demographic groups, I thought that, I think that's important so that you're not yeah. leaving a group of students behind. And, and I think, so I think all that was for the right reasons. Yeah. But I think when we started putting uh, laws in place like third grade reading retentions, and we've had massive retentions across states that did that. Florida was one of those at the time. We have that rule here. Um, you started doing things like holding kids back and, and you could have gotten to a place where a child was held back twice before fifth grade. And that that is... That is not healthy for kids. And I think a lot of that leads to, um, has led to frustrations. And so I think high stakes testing was something that is very different than when I was, we were in school or when yep. we were, when I was even an, a young teacher. Social media has changed the landscape completely. Um, that is when you think about why things are harder today around fighting, around bullying, around all of that. Um, social media, which was intended for good and can be so good can also be so negative and so bad. And so I think, you know, I've always believed in a strength overdone as a weakness. And when you think about when we overdo things to the other side or the other extreme, it becomes not good. And so we've got to think back to engaging kids again 
and le to, to love learning and love school. We are not learning to take a test. We're not. And so we, we've got to get away from that. And that is my goal is, is to make our kids love school, to, have, to help them love school and, and realize that this grade is not just about, or that number on a page does not define you. It is not, you know, the number on the page does not define you. And it's really about effort and hard work that will determine your future success. It is not because you have an IQ that determines you're gifted. It is not because you have an IQ that determines you're not. It is because you work hard you engage, um, and there's more to life than that number on a paper. Yeah. And so I, I wonder, I'm thinking, yeah. I was gonna say, I just wonder, um, you know, and I'll, I'll use most companies. And you can, Teddy's a great guy, and he's let's say he's in sales, and we love him, and he does a great job, and he's very helpful around the business, and all this and that. But if his numbers aren't there, if he's not making his quota, at some point he's going to have to work somewhere else, and and so it's still a numbers driven kind of thing. You you're accountable to others and uh, all that, but one of the things we don't want to lose sight of it's a people business. Yeah. And yeah. and you were dealing like you said with with small and in some cases larger bodies here. We're not we're not educating robots, and so uh, I think we lose sight of of that at our to our detriment that uh, yeah. we're, we're in the people, same thing, well, we're in a people business. Well, and right? can I we're, also say one more, one more thing? Because yeah. I, I take on a lot of responsibility for what happens with our kids. I take it personally. I take every success personally, every loss personally, every kid yeah. that determines I'm not going to do this uh, personally. Um, but, and I, and I know that we've put a lot on education systems to be all things and I do think that we've got to, to know that this is, we're all in this. We're all in this. It is from yep. our community. It's everybody, elected officials, school system people, everybody is parents. part of parents. Yep. We're all part of this puzzle of, that's going to determine our future success. Yeah. Trisha McManus has been our guest today. Trisha is the superintendent for, and it's a mouthful, Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, WS slash FCS, for those in the know. Trisha, thank you for joining. Appreciate it. Trisha, you learned a lot. Really good. You learned I, a lot I wrote a note. I wrote a note yeah. that I like, wow, I knew that Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools was doing things differently and better and more. But you just opened up uh, a yeah. whole lot of stuff that I didn't know all about. So thank you very much uh, yeah. uh, for all that you're doing for our community yeah, in Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools. And by the way, I will tell you that being a husband of a teacher, a father of a teacher, um, I very clearly know that that is a huge part of the success, the teachers who want, yeah. and that's yeah. a, a lot of work to make sure you have the teachers who want to be there. So, yeah, um, cool. Randy, Thanks, Trisha. A close yeah. out point. Uh, well, I just have just not a, we, Trisha, we usually have a story, something we learned from the guest today or something that brought a flashback from back in the day. And I just remember, again, my mom is a school teacher and, and some of the challenges mm -hmm. that she faced, I, I'm sure still exist today, uh, you know, teacher versus parent student, kind of the support there and the support from the administration to the teacher. And, but you know what, that exists in all companies. Communication is, is one of the single biggest challenges we all face. Uh, in, in business life and, and such, and, and teaching is no exception. So I really, really like what you were talking about, how you set the expectations, how you're clear about objectives and communicate those on a consistent basis. So hats off to you. I appreciate that. Teddy, uh, we, you got a quick story? Quick, quick story. Yep. Um, All right. Trisha said that one of the assets that she has available to her and we have available are the volunteers who show up. Uh, I don't know how Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools work with showing up in a classroom, but I you said you have thousands of, of, of thousands of volunteers who show up on a regular basis. I encourage you in no matter what county you're in to become one of those volunteers. Not only will it have a significant impact on a kid's life, but it can have a great impact on your life. That's my story. Yeah, and real quick, Tricia, if somebody does want to get involved, uh, what's the point of contact there? Yeah. How do they do that? Get there, go to our district webpage. Um, there's a place for volunteers mm -hmm. and just sign up and you get a call. Sign up on the list and we've got a whole office that handles volunteers as part of our communications team under Brent Campbell. Yeah. And who is we a celebrity. A, a shout <laughs> out to Brent. Uh, I knew him back in his, his days working in uh, TV back back 
years ago <laughs> in a previous life. Yeah. But uh, thank you, Brent, for helping uh, facilitate all of this. By the way, our next week's guest on the 16th will be Jamile yeah. McBride. And we're going to talk about resilience, resourcefulness, and relationships. And it kind of dovetails with some of the things that you're yeah. talking about here and how we unpack some of the, the the challenges between our ears and how that impacts our ability to learn. So good stuff coming up. Uh, Teddy, why don't you take us on out of here and buy us lunch? Cool. Trisha, again, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank Randy, you. good seeing you, buddy. Thank Amen. you to our audience for showing up on LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube and our podcast and the people who showed up at the show today. Appreciate you all of you showing up. Remember, the Elder Law Firm is one of our sponsors. We're grateful for all their help. If you need help with elder law, elder care, or estate planning, reach out to them. And you guys have an absolutely fantastic week. We'll see you next week. Bye. Great. Thank you now. See you.